Okay, these are a few pages of the notebook that, or notebooks that uh, contain ideas uh, for Pan's Labyrinth. Some of the oldest notebook pages you're going to see are from 1993, and they're in very different style than the notebook now. So you're going to browse between uh, sepia, antique-looking pages, and some uh, Filofax blue pages. All of them contain drawings and notes that fructified into being in Penn's Labyrinth. Originally, in creating the Pale Man, uh, which was one of the, I mean, this is the second notebook of Pan, and I tried to create a creature that was called the Nerve Ghost, you know, which is here. There's also a William Stout version of it, obviously much better than this. And then I thought that the Pale Man could be, uh, the character of the ogre could be a wooden man that was part of the roots of the tree. You know, I drew this, it's a little bit like a Giorgio de Chirico painting, but then I came up with the idea that something could come out of his mouth that was organic and was very disturbing. But then I tried to make the face a little more like a wooden puppet. And then these little doors would open and something organic would be living inside. But when I reached this point, I realized that this was far too much of an intellectual abstraction for the girl. This was too sophisticated. The girl would not uh, reconceive any opposing forces as a puppet with a wooden set of drawers. and It was too sophisticated. It was too surreal. So then I came up with the idea of making the pale man actually more like a pale figure in a crimson room that had loose flesh. And I originally thought the eyes would be closed and then when they opened they would drift apart you know like they were in a they were not in a solid mass but they would drift apart and then i asked them to sculpt him like they were sculpting an old man that lost a lot of weight and when the sculpture arrived i did a sketch of it and i removed the face because it reminded me uh, of a manta ray it's very disturbing to have the flat, faceless effect of a manta ray belly, how it's just a slit for a mouth and two little nostrils that look like eyes. It's very disturbing for some reason. And then I came up with the idea of using the stigmata that the character had and put the eyes there. And I remember that poster of a woman screaming and the eyes, the hands were translucent and you could see the eyes. And I came up with that idea. If you do violence or uh, any, any graphic stuff in a movie, you can either make it spectacle or dramatic. And I think, for example, if I, sta if I stab a character in the belly, that's, that's uh, you know, doesn't register. It's like movie violence. Or is the same as Bruce Willis with a cut here bleeding this way, or a cut in the cheek bleeding this way, that's, that doesn't hurt, right? But if the cut is in the lip, or if you stab somebody on the ear or in the armpit, this, that's violence that immediately elicits a reaction. It's very empathic. So designing the moments to actually create an impact on the, on the audience emotionally, to make it off-putting as opposed to uh, spectacular, you know. Uh, I think violence can be cartoonish and spectacular, like Tom and Jerry, or it can be very harrowing, you know. And, uh, and so all the designs in the notebook that deal with the violence, or the, the designs in the notebook that deal with the aspects of the movie, they, they're designed to have an emotional impact on an audience. And the hand, I thought, was a kind of breaking that would give you the wheelies immediately because you, you, that, that is an impossible angle for the hand. <laughs> the phone in the beginning of the movie says uh, we want to make sure that your nature is intact. 
that you have not become a mortal. And that's what they're testing. They're not testing her to become a successful little uh, golden retriever. She's not about to go fetch this, go fetch that. It's her character. That's why it's important that we use the faces of the moon. You know, not only are they mythologically strong and the moon is essentially a feminine symbol, but the fact is that it's Ophelia becoming a full self, a full feminine self at the end. Normally moon is linked to silver in alchemy and moon is linked uh, to, to uh, the femininity. You know, it's a feminine entity, just as the sun is seen as a masculine entity. Uh, don't ask me why, some people elaborate in books, they, they say that it's because in its mo most vulnerable moments, man uh, being alone at night and the moon watching over primitive man, it became sort of a nurturing motherly figure. Other people attribute it to the fact that the moon doesn't have a, a light of its own and people tended to feel that it was more magical because of that and it was always changing. And the moon is always uh, transforming and becoming and uh, it's never static. The sun is. The sun always comes and goes except in an eclipse essentially the same way every day. But the moon is in transformation. So the moon is seen as a symbol of transformation, of change, of metamorphosis. So if the story is about a girl becoming a woman, there's no better symbol than that. Una princesa. It is important that some of the solutions and the images in the real world have fantasy resonance to them. For example, the girl uses uh, an elixir in the real world to take the captain down, which is the elixir of the medicine that the doctor gave her, you know. The captain uh, polishes his boots, which boots are incredibly important in fairy tales, like seven league boots in Tom Tom, you know. And I give him that characteristic and it's not accidental. The fact that mirrors, which are another important thing in, in magical things, are used uh, a couple of times in the movie when the girl looks at her shoulder and when the captain is shaving. You can see how I think the girl is watching the world and learning about that world through her fantasy. And it's very important also to see the forces that are at play in the, in the magical world that play in the real world or echoed in some form in the real world. The pale man, the faceless thing that devours children can either be the captain or the priest at the table, whatever, you know, the organized church or organized politics or whatever you want to make of it, it's a force in the real world and it's a force in the fantasy world.